The Training and Work of an Initiate by Dion Fortune, 1996, Book Review. Quote, the word initiate, as used in these pages, means one in whom the higher self, the individuality, has coalesced with the personality and actually entered into incarnation in the physical body. An initiate, therefore, it is that looks out through his, his eyes. The personality is reduced to a set of habit complexes of living, leaving the higher self free to carry on its work with minimum demands upon its attention from the physical plane. The path of the initiate is well defined in this book. This book makes clear the path and the many experiences that the initiate may have upon it. Most of the experiences met with are among the most glorious in the macrocosm and are, I believe, the highest level of achievement a human being may experience in the material world. Talking to someone about such experiences who have not themselves not had similar experiences would often be a waste of time, so I will not attempt to describe them now. I will, however, say that these things are far from material wealth and gain, for greed is only another chain holding the initiate to the stone prison of the devil. A, pres- a person can gain more wealth of the soul while walking the path of the initiate than can a person living as a king gain mon- in monetary wealth who lives for a hundred lifetimes. Part 1. Dion Fortune divides her book into three parts. The first part is called Ethical, and in this section she discusses subjects such as laying the ethical foundations of initiation, the way of initiation, preparation for initiation, and the daily life on the path of the initiation. In the chapter Laying the Foundations, she describes the heavy oaths that are often forced upon the initiates of occultism, and how they would be punished by their fellow initiates and the higher powers whom they sinned against if they were to break those oaths. She says that many great insights come from spiritual intuition, but that most people do not have the well-correlated vehicle of consciousness to understand all the symbols of the intuitive revelations. I agree with what she says about the preparation of the mind and consciousness, and I find, as with most of her advice, that it aids me in practically in my own studies and practices. I also found that this chapter of the book brought me to a deeper understanding of the Kabbalistic rituals and in what way they aid spiritual development. Quote, I would therefore urge those who desire the higher knowledge to set immediately about the task of correlating their vehicles of consciousness, and especially the mental ones, so that when the higher knowledge is revealed to them, they may act as links between that which is above and their fellow men who as yet stand upon the lower step of the great stair. End quote from laying the foundations. In the chapter The Way of Initiation, Dion Fortune says that most people in the world are happy with how the world is, as long as it doesn't treat them too badly. She states that most people take for granted the inevitability of suffering, as long as it does not affect them directly. Then, from the whirlwind of the mundane, she brings a light of hope, saying that there are However, a few men and women who are not content with what they see, but are urged forward into the depths of being to search for the occult truth. These people are the initiates, whether they know it consciously or not. Dion Fortune outlines two kinds of initiation. Physical initiation, in which the person is initiated into the tradition of Western esoteric wisdom that has been formulated and collected by men and women over the centuries. Quote, the second form of initiation is declared to be a spiritual experience wherein the soul establishes contact with the higher powers and is admitted to the fellowship of great souls on the inner planes. End quote. These are the people who run in the walk of evolution. This particular chapter in the book I feel was meant for every human being on earth to read quote the gate is open it is for him to tread the path end quote the way of initiation the third chapter preparation for initiation defines initiation and what it is to be an initiate for me this has greatly helped to improve my somewhat vague understanding of initiation for though I could always understand what fortune meant by the words initiate and initiation when used in context my actual definition was never clear I now know what the word initiate that the word initiate means, quote, this is a high grade of initiation and is normally preceded by lesser initiations of graded intensity, end quote. 
means someone whose higher self has overcome their personality. According to Fortune, this is the highest level of physical existence anyone may achieve. The integration of how Fortune explains what initiation is and the contacting of a master is written in such a way that it brought me to a form of self-realization on the subject. The image Fortune sets of the master first contacting the student superconsciously and then imprinting the master's symbol and ray of operations on the student's kether sphere, kether meaning crown, the first sephira, highest point of manifestation, ehie, above their head is an image of occult clarity. After defining and discussing initiation, Fortune goes on in this chapter to detail the options following initiation, the path of the mystic and the path of the occultist. The former path is one where the mystic, after completing the cycle of reincarnation, stays in his liberated state, for the mystic views the flesh as a form of bondage of which he must break free. The latter path, however, differs from the former in that the occultist, once reaching liberation from the flesh, returns to the plane of form, earth. The occultist's goal is to then aid humanity, as did Jesus of the Christ, energy or ray. Quote, that the mystic aims at escaping from the bondage of flesh never to return, whereas the occultist designs to return to matter, bearing with him the fruits of his labors, end quote. It is not, however, that the mystic abandons the world, for his prayers help to lift the planet's karma on the inner planes. When I had read the chapter, I came to the realization that my goal, my goal, and what I believe is the obvious goal, is to be both mystic and occultist in one, as was Jesus. The closing chapter in this ethical part of her book is entitled Daily Life on the Path, in which she says that the initiate's life is in many ways the same and yet different as the majority of the population. The initiate lives in an understanding of the all-ruling principles, and she then moves onward to describe the first principle. Quote, The first principle to be learned concerns the nature of the cosmic laws and their inviolability. Students must accept the concept of the absolute rule of law that nothing is fortuitous, accidental, or incidental. End quote. The remainder of the chapter is spent in the further discussion of this first principle, but she does not touch on any further principles. I felt that only discussing one of the many supposed principles did not decrease the value of the chapter, for she further integrates the karmic doctrine as a part of this first principle and keeps the chapter interesting and informative. Fortune states that the initiate is someone who accepts and understands all the principles, and in doing so, he is able to live his life to the highest spiritual standards. Quote, Yet the initiate goes to meet the king of terrors, as to a crowning. For to him, death is not the end of the world, but the Northwest Passage. End quote. Dion Fortune, a shout out to Mr. Thatcher. Part two. The second part is called Theoretical. In this section, she delves deeply into the theories of occultism. She dictates three chapters to the ground plan of Illuminism, which for me brought a great deal of Illuminism especially in her definitions of mysticism and occultism. She then devotes the rest of this section to the headwaters of occultism and the sources of the esoteric Christian tradition. In the chapter Ground Plan of Illuminism, Part 1, Fortune continues to discuss the various differences between mysticism and occultism. She states that they are simply two different paths to the same goal, reunion with the Godhead. She, Fortune, clarifies the two paths together under one title, Illuminism. So it is the objective of these three well-organized chapters to give the reader a ground plan of Illuminism. In Fortune's well-understood definitions of mysticism and occultism, I occasionally have the feeling that some of her examples are biased. This opinion may be true, but it could also very well be due to a lack of knowledge on my part, for this is the first book I have read in which someone compares the two paths to each other. To give a stronger impression of what the two paths are like, Fortune gives some examples. Buddhism, Christianity, and some secondary movements such as Christian thought fortune classifies as mysticism. Hinduism, Kabbalistic Judaism, and derivatives such as Theosophy, Alchemy, and Spiritualism she classifies as occultism. With this and all other thoughts and subjects crammed into this small six-page chapter, it seem, all seems difficult to understand. If it was not for the following two chapters, in which all is made clear. In the following two chapters, devoted to the ground plan of Illuminism, Fortune discusses black and white magic and the power the seer has to gaze into the astral realm of Maya, illusion. She also gives a further definition of what magic truly is. To know more, one must read this excellent book. Quote, when we are considering such vast and ramifying subjects as the supernormal sciences, some schematic classification is necessary, for they range from psychism to ceremonial magic and from the mystic's divine union to pacts with non-human entities who may or may not be the devil. 
End quote. The unfortunate ground plan of Illuminism. In the chapter, The Headwaters of Occultism, the questions as to why occultists seek knowledge in ancient cultures, superstition, are brought up in the first paragraph and answered in the second. This is done in a clear and straightforward way and left no space for misinterpretation. The reason I am stating this so clearly is that after the first two paragraphs, the chapter continues in a different and possibly confusing direction. It took me a large amount of concentration to follow her somewhat erratic line of thought. This could be for several reasons. Once again, it may be due to my lack of knowledge, but I found that she jumped from vague term to another. From one vague term to another. She did not take the time to explain what she meant. Through all her irregularity, I did, in the end, have one solid concept in mind. The concept was that of the rays of life and evolution, which are well explained in the book Esoteric Psychology by Alice A. Bailey. The rays are, in a sense, the headwaters of occultism. They are the dawn and dusk of each period of existence. At the dawning of each ray there comes a harbinger, as was Jesus Christ of the Christ ray. These harbingers fortune calls Manu, or priest kings, but fortune stresses that they are only forerunners to take the evolution of people of that ray and age through the gates of evolution. Fortune mentions Manu such as Melchizedek, of whom I have heard reference to only in her other books, she also mentions the Manu Narada, who founded the Temple of the Sun in the city of the Golden Gates in Lost Atlantis. For this I can only take her word as an adept in the greater mysteries. Quote, Where do occultists look for source of their wisdom? What are its classics and when was its golden age? People are sometimes surprised that the occultist should take seriously the scientific views of the ancients concerning himself with humors and all the jargon of alchemy. All such things, it is said, have been outmoded ever since the Renaissance. Why waste such time on such exploded superstitions? End quote. The Headwaters of Occultism, opening paragraph. In the chapter, The Sources of the Esoteric Christian Tradition, Fortune brings to light many of the reasons why Christianity has undergone so many separations since its beginning. Whereas many other religions, such as the Egyptian, Mesopotamian, and Celtic religion, underwent so little separation. One of the primary problems with which Christianity had was that many of its followers were initiates of the greater mysteries, and many were not. Examples of Christian initiates were St. Paul and St. John, of whom Fort Dion Fortune says, quote, the influence of the mystery training can be clearly seen in their work, end quote. Fortune says that it was largely due to the clashing of the initiates and non-initiates of the Christian tradition that caused so many ripples in the sea of the Christ ray. These ripples then manifested in the form of rivalry, and the eventual persecution of the Christian and non-Christian initiates conducted by the Christian non-initiates. This led to the almost complete extinction of the mysteries of Christ, and so unknowingly the Christians caused the disappearance of the true heart of Christianity. But the heart was still there. Buried deep in the biblical texts, there are the teachings of the Judaic Kabbalah, as well as the doctrines of reincarnation and the physics of the higher planes. In the apocalyptic texts, we see many remnants of the Greek schools of initiation and the influence of Kabbalistic thought. She then simply brings the question of how to bridge the gap between lost Christian esotericism and the Western mystery tradition. After answering this question, she progresses into the study of the post-Gnostic attempts at initiation. Unlike the previous chapter, I found this one easy and enjoyable to read. It brought up many interesting questions in my mind and hinted at pathways to answers. Quote, these influences brackets, those of the Alexandrian Greek and Kabbalistic, crystallized into the Gnostic aspect of Christianity. Later, however, there were other, other attempts at reviving the mysteries, and the three most notable of these were, first, the school of initiation, which had for its symbol the grail and the round table, and which drew its inspiration from druidical sources. This school disappeared in the general disorganization during the Dark Ages. Secondly, the Knights Templar, who, while fighting the infidel in the Holy Land, came in touch with the last survivors of a secret tradition of Israel and gained them, gained from them, received initiation. But they brought back to Europe the secrets thus gained, giving them a Christian expression until their suppression in AD 1307. Curiously, that curious movement, which announced itself by the publication of the Fama Fraternitatis, this gave rise to alchemy. End quote. Dion Fortune, the sources, the sources of the esoteric Christian tradition. Part 3. The third part is called Practical, in which I found the two most valuable chapters, the training of the mind and the training of the body. I found this book very well organized and her points made to the point and bluntly, which I found for me only increased the effectiveness of her writing. In what I found to be one of the most interesting chapters in the book, 
The training of the mind. Fortune addresses one of the three key tools used in practical occultism, the mind. She divides the mind into having three main faculties, feeling, will, and reason. Quote, we should thus see feeling and reason in polarity and the kinetic will as a result from their union. End quote. She describes the formula and uses of the magical weapons, uses of the magical weapons, and the way in which the etheric double is empowered with the specific vibratory energy that is channeled through the physical weapon. The way in which this is said by Fortune clarified many obscurities about the process. She then firmly teaches that a necessary step in strength is strengthening the will. She says that this is done by focusing of the will on one specific point. This, she says, doesn't, isn't, this, she states, not from personal opinion, but from occult doctrine. She th- such things are obvious when a person is in touch with their true will or higher self. She warns that the initiate follows a path of strict discipline so that he becomes in complete control of his will. Without this, the initiate will be unprepared for the road ahead. I fully realized that the necessity of the training will and this part of the chapter had a strong effect on me. For, as she says in her example, the untrained will can slow magical operations considerably if the magician cannot keep his concentration. For example, I was once attempting to travel astrally to visit a friend, but in the process my concentration slipped and I found myself wandering around my elementary school. This was a particularly interesting experience for me, especially when several days later a classmate, having no knowledge of my previous astral travel, said she saw me in a dream on the same night as my trip. Yeah, that happened. She said she was dreaming while in actuality she was unconsciously astral traveling, maybe. She reported that she was at the elementary school and saw me appear from nowhere looking quite confused and then I left. That was all due to my lack of concentration while plotting my astral goal. I must confess I am very glad for this experience. It helped me confirm my somewhat skeptic views about interactions with other people in the astral here now. Brackets, a term commonly used to describe the astral duplicate of the physical plane. Unfortunately, this chapter is too numerous in details to analyze everything, but this was my opinion, of, in my opinion, a well-formatted and well-thought-out chapter. Quote, it is not but in the elaborate processes used in the preparation of a magical weapon that the virtue lies, but in the condition produced in the etheric counterpart of that article by the handling and thought concentration that it undergoes in the course of the operation. It is magnetized, firstly, by the personal magnetism of the operator, secondly, an aura of thought forms and is built up around it, and thirdly, by the right use of the imagination and the will, it is made the physical vehicle of an invisible cosmic force, contacted by the operator and concentrated by him. End quote. The training of the mind. In the chapter following the training of the mind, the training of the body, she discusses the various forms of energy and how they relate one another and to the physical plane in human body. She speaks of the three forms of energy known to common man, heat, light, and electricity. The fourth form of energy is known to exoteric science and common man. It is what Fortune calls the astral light. Oh, the fourth form of energy is unknown to exoteric science and common man. It is what Fortune calls the astral light or akasha. There are many different words that have been used to to describe this higher form of energy, but regardless of what you call it, it is still the same thing. Fortune backs up the multitude of theories about the manifestation of etheric forces transforming into form. This is the backbone of magic the magician's will manifesting into the plane of form. The above theories are put forth in an easy-to-understand way, and if the reader is knowledgeable in such things as I am, he will understand the importance of everything previously discussed. Fortune then moves on to discuss the importance of sound, mind, and body. For otherwise, the magician will be unable to contact and control the necessary forces. She briefly touches on the subject of diet, but since this is fully outlined in her book, Sane Occultism, she does not go into details. I think a very important part of this chapter was her discussion of the body as a conduit for Akasha, the astral light. Hence, the reason are for a clean and pure conduit. If his body is diseased, the magician may pick up unwanted negative or discordant forces. Quote, the Akasha is capable of being molded by emotional forces of the astral plane. 
and in its turn is capable of influencing the other etheric subplanes, but it cannot influence the dense matter. The ethers, however, in their kinetic states, as heat, light, and electricity, can influence dense matter, and so, if we know how to use it, we have a line of communication between mind and matter via the akasha, or astral light. And it is this Jacob's Ladder that is used by initiates in their work, end quote, the training of the body. The information in tr the training and work of an initiate corresponds to other materials I have read upon the same and similar subjects, as well as the personal experiences I have had upon the path. 1996 Book Review by Frater R.C. The Training and Work of an Initiate by Dion Fortune. 1996.